Hey everyone, welcome to day 12 of Advent of Code 2022, Hill Climbing Algorithm. In this video, I'll be explaining my solutions to both of the puzzles, including my code and my thought process. As always, my code is going to be in the GitHub repository, which is linked to in the description. You can go ahead and check that out below. Today, I finished both puzzles in 10 minutes, which is pretty fast, and I'm proud of that. I got rank 109 for both parts, and that's pretty high up. I think I missed rank 100 by just like 21 seconds, which is very close but you can definitely see improvement here in my um, rankings. So I'll be explaining the puzzles, but first you'll get to see a time-lapse of me solving the puzzles. So let's go to that. Okay, so today's puzzle was your yearly map search puzzle. Rather, we can say graph finding um, puzzle where we are searching through a grid this time. So let's go through the puzzles. You try contacting the elves using your handheld device, but the river you're following must be too low to get a decent signal. We have a height map of the surrounding area where the height map is broken into a grid and the elevation of each square in the grid is given by a single lowercase letter where A is the lowest elevation, B is the next lowest, and so on, with the highest elevation being Z. We also have a starts and an end, um, where starts is our current position and end is where we should get the best signal we're trying to get from start to end. But we want to do this in the fewest number of steps as possible. Now, of course, we can't just go through any path on the grid. There have to be restrictions from any grid, um, from any grid square. We can only go to a destination square that is at most one higher than the current elevation. So, for example, if we're at M, then we can only go to um, surrounding squares with elevation N or lower, but not elevation O. What we have to do is to find the shortest path from start to end given these conditions. So, um, first thing I did in my code was we have to parse the input, and this is my large input. I do have to say, um, Eric created very nice maps for today's puzzles. Um, they're not just like a random graph. They actually look like they have some topography to them, which looks really nice and you can see it visually over here. I hope someone makes a visualization in the subreddit. That would be really cool. Anyways, let's take a look at the sample input. Um, all we have to do is first break this into an actual grid because currently it's just a bunch of lines of strings. Um, so I read it to a list by splitting up by new lines and then go through every line inside this list of strings and break it up further into a list of characters. So now we have an n by m grid of characters. We can easily access things inside this grid. Let's see, the next thing we want to do is figure out where our start position is because it's not always going to be in the top left corner, which was a mistake I made, by the way. I assumed <clears throat> it was always in the top left corner, which uh, resulted in me losing a minute on this problem. So we just go through literally every square in the grid, um, looping from i from 0 to n, representing the row, and j from 0 to m, representing the column. Check if the character in the grid is an s or an e. If so, then we assign it to the start or the end character, uh, I mean variable. Um, so now we know where the start location is and where the end location is as well. Next thing I have is just a quick helper function which takes in a character and spits out its height. So normally if it's a regular character, like lowercase a to um, lowercase z, then we can access it within this ASCII lowercase string, which we also, um, which I also used in day three. So you should check out that video where I explain um, what this string is. But basically, it's just a string containing all the lowercase English characters. So if it's inside the string, then we can simply return the index of that character to get its height. Otherwise, if it's an S, um, we assume it has height a, and if it's an E, we assume it ha has height z. Um, and those correspond to 0 and 25 in terms of integers, respectively. Okay, so our actual plan, that was just parsing input and some helper functions. Our actual plan is to use Dijkstra's algorithm. And if you're not familiar with Dijkstra's, I'm going to give a brief overview right now. The idea is that we start at the starting location, and then we slowly work our way outwards in a sort of breadth-first search type thing. If you're not familiar with breadth-first search, that's okay. Essentially, we are maintaining a list of locations that we are currently searching, and then recursively from each location, we go outwards and look at new locations. So the thing about Dijkstra's is that we will prioritize searching new locations that are um, closer. That is, within this list of locations that we are currently searching through, we will grab the one that has the shortest current cost or shortest number of steps to get to so far. So as we're expanding this list of locations that we are searching, we are always searching through the smallest one, and once we get to the ending location, then we'll be done because we are guaranteed that we're searching locations in order of shortest uh, distance to get to them. Anyways, Dijkstra's algorithm is 
a little bit more complicated there could be like a whole video about it so i would recommend looking at a couple of resources about it which i will link to in the description there was also a puzzle from last year that required dijkstra's and i explained it in a bit more detail in that video so i would recommend checking that out as well it'll probably be um, in the corner up there um, so let's just go through my code i'm going to assume that you know how dijkstra's works so first thing we have to do is since we don't have an edge list or like a adjacency list or anything like that, we have to determine um, all of the valid neighbors that we can go to from any given position. So this is sort of the standard grid search thing. Um, we just look at a current position. We can only go up, down, left, or right. So we iterate through all of these differentials. In our current location, we could either move one zero represents down because we are incrementing our row by one. Negative one zero represents moving up. Similarly, this represents moving to the right and this represents moving to the left. So we're going to search in all four directions and then calculate our new coordinates based on those differentials. So ii is going to be the new possible neighbor um, where we just add i, our current row, to the current differential that we're looking at inside this loop. Um, similarly for jj. We have to check that this location is within the map. So in Python, this is really nice. What we can do is actually just write this expression 0 less than or equal to ii less than or equal to less than n, um, strictly less than n. And this will tell us whether ii is inside the range of valid rows. Similarly for jj, we check if it's between 0 and m, not including m, where that's the range of possible columns. And we have to check if it's within this uh, range just to make sure we don't access anything outside of the grid because we can't walk outside the grid. Okay, and then we just have to check the height condition. We look at the heights of the neighbor that we're looking at, and we have this function that we wrote earlier to help us out. We look at that height and see if it's at least, or rather if it's at most, um, one greater than our current height. If so, we can move to it um, based on the puzzle description. Yeah, right here. So now we have a function that can return a list of neighbors that we can possibly go to given our current location, um, just according to the uh, height conditions. Cool. Okay, now we do DFS or something. This is actually Dijkstra's. Uh, we're going to initialize our heap or priority queue of uh, locations that we're currently searching. Again, this is that list of places we're searching. And the priority queue or heap is just going to help us uh, always search the shortest location that we can visit. In Python, priority queues slash heaps are implemented in the heap queue library. And this is really nice because they provide convenience functions to allow you to just like manipulate heaps really easily. So we start out our heap with the current location, and this contains data about the distance to get to that location, as well as the row and column. So zero is the current number of steps we have to take to get to the start, and we just have our starting coordinates, uh, start zero and start one, which we computed um, right after we parsed the input. So now we have our heap, and we're also going to keep track of the places that we have visited so far. That's just going to be a, another grid, another n by m grid, which is initially all false because we have visited none of the locations. And we're going to change this grid as we search through the actual grid. Some of these are going to become true. So uh, we have this while true loop, but don't worry, we're not going to run forever. We're going to stop when we get to the ending location. Uh, we take the first element from our heap, and heap pop is just going to return the element that is smallest inside this heap. And since we're using tuples, it's going to return the one with the smallest distance. I should clarify all the elements in our heap are going to be three element tuples that are like distance slash cost um, row slash column. So we have these three pieces of information about the current closest location that we can search um, row I column J. If we've already visited this location before and this is possible if we've like taken a longer route to reach a place that we've already seen then we don't want to consider it because we already know that we can achieve the we can already reach the current position in a faster way. Otherwise, if we haven't visited it yet, then we're going to mark our current position as visited to make sure we don't come back in the future. Um, and now we just check if we have reached the end, because if so, then we are done. We can just print out the number of steps that we have taken so far and then just break to make sure we don't keep on looping and searching. Otherwise, we're going to go through all of our neighbors, which again, we have created this function, which helps us return all the possible positions we can search given our current position. Um, go through all the neighbors and just add them on top of the heap using this heap push function. I'm also going to link the documentation for the heap queue library in the description. It's very helpful, would recommend checking it out if you haven't already. So we just push the uh, neighbor element onto the heap where we increment steps by one, by, by one because we have to move one step to get to our neighbor as well as the locations of our neighbor, which are um, row ii column jj. Okay, so that's it for part one. It was a pretty standard Dijkstra implementation. Again, if you want to learn more about Dijkstra's, uh, you can check out the links in the description for some resources. So now let's look at part two. As you walk up the hill, you suspect that the elves still want to turn this into a hiking trail. The beginning isn't very scenic though. Perhaps you can find a better starting point.
So it turns out this time the trail can start as low as elevation A, um, or rather we are still starting at elevation A, um, but now we can start from any elevation A. We don't have to start from S necessarily, but we can find any square elevation A to go to. And I just realized that I did something wrong in my code. I will elaborate that on um, in a in a few minutes. Uh, so the thing we have to check uh, the thing we have to check for this time is a little bit different. Instead of starting from all possible A locations, which is certainly possible, but there's just a lot of A's to search, um, I thought it'd be quicker just to start at the end and backtrack. So what we're going to do this time is we're going to do the same Dijkstra's algorithm, but instead of starting from S and ending at E, we're going to start at E and end at any A location. This is a common Dijkstra strategy if you have like bi-directional paths. Um, this isn't exactly bi-directional, it's not symmetrical, I'll explain in a bit, but it, when you have like multiple starting locations and you have one ending location, it's often useful to backtrack and start from the end instead of starting at the beginning. That can just make things quicker. So we have our same code, exact same code, except now the neighbor code is different. Um, instead of only being able to move to locations that are at most one higher than our current location, we can only move backwards to locations that are at least one lower. Um, than our current location because you can imagine um, we can't just uh, go backwards onto a really low step because we can't make the climb up we can only like go at most one down um, or we could like go way up but that's the restriction we have to make sure that the neighbor's height is at least uh, one less than our current height to make sure we can backtrack to that position and uh, the rest of the code is mostly the same. We're doing the same DFS algorithm. Um, it's actually Dijkstra's. And what we're doing is just changing two things. Instead of starting at the start, we start at the end, because remember, we're backtracking. So we start at the ending coordinates, which we pre-processed pre up here, and 0 and 1. That's going to be the row and column of the E character. And our stop condition, instead of checking that we're at the end, we want to check that our current height is at 0 because now we are allowed to start technically from any um, A character or any position that has the same height as A. So whenever we hit um, one of those elevations, then we can stop because it means we have a path from that character up to E. So yeah, that's it for day 12 of Advent of Code 2022. I hope the explanations were helpful, but if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, feel free to leave it down below. Uh, again, there will be a bunch of links in the description for both my code um, as well as resources for Dijkstra's. And I have a private leaderboard that you can check out, which is uh, linked to in the description as well. You can check out the code. We now have 58 people, so that's a decent amount. And I'll see you tomorrow for day 13. Uh, thanks for watching.